Hi, my name is Connie, and I will be introducing the speaker this morning. Dr. Leda Hong Fincher is an associate research scholar at Columbia University Weatherhead East Asian Institute. She's a longtime journalist turned scholar and has written for the New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, Descent Magazine, and others. She has won the Society of Professional Journalists Sigma Delta Chi Award for her China reporting. Dr. Hong Fincher was the Beijing correspondent for Voice of America from 2000 to 2003, but when the Chinese Foreign Ministry did not regrant her journalist visa, she decided to do a PhD in China. Fluent in Mandarin, she is the first American to receive a PhD from Tsinghua University Department of Sociology in Beijing. While at Tsinghua University, she became deeply engrossed in her thesis, which she turned into her first book, Leftover Woman, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China, and it was named one of the best books of 2014 by the Asia Society's China File, Foreign Policy Interrupted, and Asia House. She also has a master's degree from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree with high honors from Harvard University. Dr. Hong Fincher's latest book, Betraying Big Brother, The Feminist Awakening in China, was prompted by the jailing of the Feminist Five in 2015, and it was also named one of the best books of 2018 by Vanity Fair, Newsweek, Foreign Policy Interrupted, and many others. She believes in feminist foreign policy and training young women to take on leadership positions everywhere. Her session is on The Feminist Awakening in China. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Leda Hong Fincher. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Connie. And thank you so much to the Albright Institute for inviting me here to speak. Um, this is my first time here, and um, it, it's really just very inspiring and, and wonderful to be able to speak before a group of very talented young women from um, I don't know, are you from around the world? <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I wrote a book about the feminist movement in China. But in fact, I hope that I don't, whether or not you read the entire book, um, I think there are really lessons that are applicable around the world. And um, I think that you'll find these young women who are um, activating or being activists and advocating for enormous social change inside China, um, that there are a lot of lessons to be learned from them. So before I start the talk, I thought I'd read a little excerpt from the first chapter of my book. Um, the chapter is called China's Feminist Five, and then I'll, I'll put it all in context in a minute. When Chinese authorities arrested feminist activist Wei Tingting in Beijing on March 6, 2015, just before International Women's Day, they confiscated her glasses so she could no longer see. Severely visually impaired, Wei was only able to tell people apart by their voices. State security agents took away her cell phone and laptop and demanded her passwords. They led her to a dimly lit underground area of a police station, took her warm snow boots, and put her in a small, unheated room about five square meters wide as the temperature outside fell to below freezing. Then the interrogations began. Why are you engaged in subversive activities about sexual harassment? Who is collaborating with you in your women's rights activism? Which foreign agencies are funding your actions? Wei told the blurry figures in front of her that she wanted to call a lawyer before answering any questions. You can't call a lawyer now, don't you get it? Don't you understand the law? Wei made it through one round of interrogations and thought it would be over. But in the middle of the night, she had no idea what time it was because she had no watch, the agents took her out for another interrogation. This time, someone videotaped her as she spoke. Even when she went to the toilet, a female agent observed her. For the first time in her life, Wei Tingting, just 26 years old at the time of her detention, began to think about escaping abroad. She felt disoriented and overwhelmed by a mounting sense of powerlessness. Then she heard some indistinct murmurs seeping through from outside and put her ear up against the wall of her cell to listen more closely. With astonishment, she recognized the voice of one of her sisters, Wang Man, who had taken part in some activist campaigns with her. My God, Wang Man is in here too, she thought. 
Wei yelled out to a guard that she was thirsty and needed a drink of water, then put her ear up against the wall to listen again. She made out the voices of other feminist activists who had been arrested along with her. Besides Wang Man, she could hear Li Maizu, Li's girlfriend, Teresa Xu, and several other university students who had volunteered for feminist campaigns in the past. Wei later described how she overcame her feeling of helplessness in an online essay, later deleted, she called Prison Notes, which she posted on WeChat under a pseudonym. I decided I must resist this feeling of sorrow and take action. So I started to do a lot of different things. My room was freezing and I was only allowed to wear slippers. So I began doing leg exercises such as kicks and squats. Then I did deep meditation exercises. Other people before me had scratched words onto the old walls. So I squinted my eyes up close to the walls to examine them. Then I spun around in circles singing songs, she wrote. Wei sang out loud, both to cheer herself up and to let the other detained women hear her voice and know that they were not alone, that she too was in there with them. Li Maidza also sang back a song for all women, the anthem of China's feminist movement. Protect my rights, don't keep me down. Why must I lose my freedom? Let's break free from our heavy shackles and reclaim our power as women. Her spirits buoyed, Wei Ting Ting writes, she recovered her sense of defiance. Even as I heard two guards walking back and forth, making clanking noises outside, I felt a kind of joy in betraying Big Brother. So that's where the title of the book comes from. So the women who became known as the Feminist Five were these five young women. They were detained um, in a massive roundup of feminist activists that Chinese police undertook in quite a few different Chinese cities on the eve of International Women's Day in 2015. And um, I'm not going to name all of them, but the uh, woman whose excerpt I, I read from um, is on the bottom middle there, Wei Ting Ting. And so uh, you see her glasses there. Um, without her glasses, she couldn't see anything. And the first thing that all of the guards did when they, they uh, jailed these women was to confiscate their glasses. And the only woman who could see anything without her glasses was Li Maizu on the upper right-hand side. Um, now, these women had actually been involved as feminist activists for a few years leading up to their jailing in 2015. But they were really marginal figures. But to give you an example of the kinds of activities that they held in China, uh, they called these activities performance art because China is a country that does not have freedom of assembly. You're not allowed to go on the streets and hold protests. Um, you also don't have internet freedom. You don't have uh, freedom of speech. Um, but these women, there were uh, approximately 100 or so feminist activists in different cities uh, around China at this time in 2012. And they were able to hold isolated acts of what they called performance art to raise awareness about different aspects of gender discrimination in China. So on the top right here is um, an action that they held calling for the introduction of a nationwide law against domestic violence. So there were three women, Wei Ting Ting, who you heard from, um, excerpt in the book is on the far right. And uh, they wore these white wedding gowns that were stained with fake red blood. And their signs are uh, saying things like, love is new, no excuse for violence. Um, and they wore these dresses in downtown Beijing and attracted a fair bit of attention. And notably, at the time, they were not arrested for that action. Um, and it shows a huge uh, difference in, in the way the Chinese authorities viewed these women from 2012 to 2015. Here's another action that they organized in uh, the southern city of Guangzhou, which is very close to Hong Kong. And they called this action Occupy Men's Toilets. 
And what they did was they went to a men's public bathroom and they asked the men to leave the stalls and invited women in to use the vacated men's stalls. And they said that this was just to call attention to the need for more public toilets for women. Um, and they attracted quite a bit of attention there. And, and in fact, the state media in China, Xinhua News, and even People's Daily, which is the mouthpiece of the Communist Party, actually ran official stories about this action because the activists had deliberately chosen topics that they thought would not be considered to be politically sensitive. Um, so they've always strategized all along to kind of walk up to the line of what is acceptable in China um, and what, what crosses the red line into something that's considered to be subversive. So in 2012, the women, uh, some of the women were questioned for a few hours by police, but nobody was ever jailed and the activists were kind of used to being called in for questioning every now and then. Um, but they were very brave and kind of cocky actually. Um, and so, so they continued to hold these kinds of activities. Um, but that really drastically changed. In 2015, it came as an enormous shock when just a couple of days before International Women's Day, which is a major holiday in China, in fact, women don't have to go to work on that day, um, the police carried out this sweeping round of arrests. They initially arrested more than 10 different feminist activists in, in a number of different cities. And then they ended up focusing on five young women um, and bringing them all to the same detention center in Beijing. And that's where the women became known as the Feminist Five, or in Chinese, Nu Qian Wu Jiemei, Feminist Five Sisters. So what the Chinese authorities were trying to do in jailing these five young women at the time was undoubtedly try to prevent the development of a large-scale feminist movement, um, just nipping, um, nipping a movement in the bud, which is typically what they do. So they, they have long uh, just taken action against troublemakers. Whenever the troublemakers cross a little bit of a line and show that they're able to organize and mobilize supporters. And at this point, the feminists were beginning to be successful in recruiting more supporters to the feminist movement. Um, but that move in jailing these five women drastically backfired because it attracted an enormous amount of international media attention. Um, and all of the major news agencies around the world covered the jailing of the Feminist Five. They became this big cause celebre. And they also, uh, their supporters created all sorts of viral hashtags like Free the Five. Um, there were protests that were held in a lot of cities around the world demanding that the Chinese government release these women. And even Hillary Clinton, who at the time in 2015 was considered a front runner for the US presidency. She tweeted um, on behalf of these women, she said, Xi, Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, hosting a meeting on women's rights at the UN while persecuting feminists, shameless. So this tweet was dated 27th of September. What she was referring to was the fact that um, the United Nations was about to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the World Conference on Women that was held in Beijing. And the co-presider of this meeting was the Chinese president, Xi Jinping. So it just highlighted the dramatic hypocrisy of uh, the Chinese president hosting a world conference on celebrating women's rights while at home in China, he was jailing fe young feminist activists. And by the way, all the activists were planning to do, they didn't even do it. They were planning to hand out stickers about sexual harassment on subways and buses. And merely for planning, for talking about doing this, um, five of them were jailed. So while the women were in jail, there were also supporters inside China who were just 
alarmed and really galvanized by the fact that these young women were jailed. It was really shocking to everybody. Um, so from the first day that they were jailed, if you see this upper right hand picture that says the first day um, the feminist activists are jailed, um, they started posting each day on Chinese social media, Weibo, which is the equivalent of Twitter, and WeChat, or Weixin, which is this massive, um, extremely popular messaging app that is used by hundreds of millions of people in China. Um, they posted these pictures of five women wearing the masks of the Feminist Five, posing in, um, in public, kind of in carefree ways, enjoying freedom of movement as though the five women were free. And the message was to just highlight each day of detention and um, to show what the women would be enjoying if they weren't in jail. They would be you know, leading carefree lives out in public. So that first picture is kind of modeled on the Beatles <coughs> Abbey Road album, the Beatles crossing the road. Each day they posted a different picture. Um, and this one below marked the 31st day of detention where there are five women wearing the masks of the Feminist Five and they're posting, they're, they're pictured outside a public toilet, which is reminiscent of one of the activists' um, Occupy Men's Toilet activities. So, um, this went on for 37 days, and there were a lot of other leaders calling for the release of the activists, and with this constant daily drumbeat of um, international media attention and diplomatic pressure, pressure from human rights organizations around the world, um, no doubt the Chinese government was completely taken aback and surprised by, um, by this enormous global reaction. Uh, on just as the Chinese president was about to preside over this United Nations meeting commemorating the 20th anniversary of the World Conference on Women. So after 37 days, the authorities suddenly without warning released the women. And that alone is really unprecedented because generally, you know, the government um, can often arbitrarily arrest people um, just for provoking trouble. Um, but in this case, they, they released all of the women. And I have no doubt that it was related to this overwhelming pressure from uh, diplomatic uh, leaders around the world and, and, um, and a lot of these very prominent voices uh, and a lot of international media attention which, by the way, you would not see today <laughs> um, because of everything else that is going on in the world. So just to switch gears a little bit, um, I write in my book about something that I call China's patriarchal authoritarianism. Again, I'm focusing on China in this book. But in fact, if you look at the world around us today, you see basically patriarchal authoritarianism Come, kind of launching a comeback in many ways in so many different countries, including in the US, I might add. Um, so in China, the form it takes, um, it's been underway for a long time, and I argue that one of the key elements of China's authoritarian repression is also patriarchal control, where um, the government is trying to get women, in particular educated Han Chinese women, to return to the home, to return to these very traditional roles for women of being a very dutiful wife and mother. And in that way, that is conducive to stability for the entire nation, that it's good for China's sovereignty to have women play these traditional submissive roles. Um, if you just look at Xi Jinping himself, ever since he became uh, president in 2000, at the end of 2002, um, beginning of 2013, um, he 
has actually done a lot to to roll back even some of the extremely limited political reforms that were introduced prior to his ascendancy to to the most supreme office in China. So under Xi Jinping, term limits for the president have been abolished. Before Xi Jinping, there used to be 10-year term limits, and it was just a widely recognized consensus that, first of all, that the leaders would all rule, they would kind of consult each other, but there's been this increasingly alarming personality cult developing under the current Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, and it's also very hyper-masculine and patriarchal. So um, the Chinese state propaganda um, unleashed this term called Jia Guo Tian Xia, which is family state under heaven. And the whole idea is that China is this very large, the nation of China is like a very large family being ruled over by the patriarch um, the head of this large family who, in the form of Xi Jinping, who's exercising paternalistic control over hundreds of millions of other families that are supposed to be patriarchal and headed by men. Um, and there was a very long article in Xinhua News, which is the primary news state news agency or propaganda source for China. A very long article, and this is a quote from the article. It says, Xi, Xi Jinping stresses the importance of family values. He says, little family, which is xiao jia in Chinese, but he has in mind the big family, guo jia. Now, guo jia is the word for country or nation state in China. Um, but this Xinhua News article explicitly breaks it down to its compounds, uh, big family or country family. Um, so it's explicitly saying that the stability of the country, it relies on the stability of individual families. And everybody in these families has to play the correct, so to speak, un quote unquote, correct role where the man is the head of the family and the woman uh, kind of reverts to this traditional role of being obedient to the husband um, and obedient to any other men, including the son when the son grows older. And through that kind of harmonious family, you achieve a harmonious and stable nation state. Um, some of these pictures here sort of show Xi Jinping and his familial roles. I would point to this one in particular where he's with his elderly mother. Um, so he's playing the role of the filial son taking care of his mother. Um, what is really striking is this is just one tiny little example from the kind of propaganda that, um, that you see every day now coming from state television, CCTV, the um, People's Daily, online, Xinhua News, um, every single day. And the propaganda really emphasizes traditional womanly Confucian virtues. It's really striking how similar the propaganda is today to very traditional Confucian didactic texts. And I would just compare it with this Qing Dynasty text from a few hundred years ago called Biographies of Exemplary Women, um, where they talk about the ideal of womanly virtue. And here's a quote from that text. The daughter obeys her parents. The daughter-in-law reverently serves her parents-in-law. The wife assists her husband. The mother guides her sons and daughters. When every state is harmonious, the state is well governed. And so this, I think, is critical to understanding what is happening in China today. And it was already happening even before Xi Jinping became president, but it's uh, become increasingly pronounced in very recent years, especially since 2015, which was a huge turning point for women's rights in China, 
with the jailing of these five young feminist activists. So to talk a little bit more about this manly personality cult under Xi Jinping, um, here are some other examples. There, there were a lot of pop songs or hip hop songs even that were created by the propaganda department um, early on in, in Xi Jinping's reign. And this, there was one song called, If You Want to Marry, Marry Someone Like Xi Dada. This was a nickname that they created, Xi Dada, which roughly translates to something like Big Daddy Xi. Um, and the, the video showed these very macho images of Xi Jinping like this one. This is a screenshot from the video where Xi Jinping is kind of wearing this very traditional Mao outfit. And he's in Tiananmen Square um, surveying the troops, the People's Liberation Army that are all congregated on Tiananmen Square. Um, and he's this commander in chief in China. Um, and uh, these kinds of really macho images um, underscore the hyper-masculine nature of the personality cult surrounding Xi Jinping. And we have not seen a personality cult like this really since the days of Mao Zedong, who was the founder of the People's Republic in 1949. Um, another thing that's really important to note is that in Xi Jinping's first major speech that he gave as General Secretary of the Communist Party, this was in January of 2013, he spoke at length about why communism collapsed in the Soviet Union and across Eastern Europe. And this line really kind of um, jumps out at you, or at me. He said, the Soviet Communist Party had more members than we do but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist. And so he goes on to say that Gorbachev was really weak and you know, uh, he implies Gorbachev was therefore feminine. He didn't, wasn't man enough to stand up and, and I, Xi Jinping, am going to be the man who's going to stand up to all of these forces. Um, the term hostile foreign forces is often used in Chinese propaganda, mainly to refer to the United States, but also Great Britain. Um, all that Xi Jinping is going to be the man who's going to stand up to all of these forces that are threatening to interfere in China and bring about the collapse of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, in all of the propaganda, and I've looked through so much of it, I've actually, this is my second book, my first book was Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. That came out in 2014. Um, for years, I've been looking at the propaganda directed at um, the Chinese people, in particular, parents of young women, uh, particularly parents of educated young Han Chinese women. Um, and they're really consistent, but under Xi Jinping in recent years, there has been a much stronger emphasis on getting these young women not just to marry, but to have babies. Um, now, what's really incredible is that at a time when China's economic growth is really stagnating, I mean, the, the economic growth figures are still relatively high compared to most other countries. But this comes after 30 years of double-digit economic growth rates. And so many people refer to the Chinese economic miracle of 30 years um, following uh, the introduction of free market reforms at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s. But that period, I emphasize, is completely over now. Um, so China is entering uh, a new period where it cannot rely on constantly rising economic growth rates. In fact, they're shrinking. Um, so for many years following the, particularly following the Tiananmen Massacre in 1989, the government jump-started reforms, economic reforms, and was able to co-opt the Chinese population basically by promising 
constantly rising living standards, which it was able to deliver on. But now that we've, we've entered this new period where Chinese people themselves across the board are feeling that their lives are not getting better, in many cases, they're getting worse. And so as, as a result, the government has to increase um, political repression in order to keep these voices of discontent under control. What's the role of women in all of this? It's absolutely critical because you would think, and in fact, a lot of neighboring countries of China, um, like just Japan and South Korea, to give two examples, they are facing uh, problems with economic growth, but also with their demographics. And this is another really key point, is that China's birth rate is plummeting, and it's plummeting at rates that are particularly alarming to the Chinese government. It, the government did not foresee just uh, how it wouldn't be able to, after over 30 years of the so-called one-child policy, limiting people, you know, interfering with women's rights, forcing abortions, um, particularly in the 1980s, um, forcing women en masse to um, insert IUDs, um, it's, the, the government is finding that it's much easier to get women to have fewer children. Um, it's another thing altogether to try to coerce women to have more babies when they don't want to. So you would think that in this kind of situation, the natural solution would be to actually promote more women's participation in the labor force. Um, so as historical context, in the early communist era, of course, there was mass suffering and, you know, the great leap forward. There were all sorts of political campaigns that created an enormous amount of suffering and death. Um, but the Chinese government was able to achieve probably the world's highest level of female labor force participation. So at the end of the 1970s, female labor force participation in the cities was 90%, which is just astronomically high when you compare it with the rest of the world. Um, since then, female labor force participation has dropped precipitously. Um, and the last official figure I have is actually, it's quite old actually, from 2010, um, but uh, female labor force participation has dropped uh, to uh, even below 70%. So I don't know exactly what, it, and again, official Chinese statistics always have to be viewed um, with a degree of skepticism, but even the Chinese government itself admits female labor force participation has continued to fall. So you would think that the government would want to promote the empowerment of women, promote more education of women, um, tell employers that they need to, to hire more women. And in fact, that's what the Japanese government is trying to do. Um, you know, Japan introduced something called womenomics, which has not been an overwhelming uh, success. Nonetheless, female participation, labor for force participation in, China in Japan has actually increased under this policy um, of getting uh, corporate boards and companies to commit to hiring and promoting a certain number of women. That is not happening at all in China. It's the, acts, it's the complete opposite. In all of this propaganda about traditional womanly virtues, there's no mention at all of the importance of working women's contributions to economic growth. Why is that then? Um, to me, it suggests that basically we've entered a new phase in China where the government no longer sees rapid economic growth as its primary goal. Um, yes, economic growth is important, but under Xi Jinping, the conclusion appears to be, if you look at all of the ratcheting up of uh, extreme forms of repression all across the country, the conclusion seems to be we need that the Communist Party needs to stay in power. 
That's the bottom line. And, um, and the authorities appear to have decided that it's in the interests of the Communist Party to uh, not to promote women's participation in the economy, in the workforce, but to get them, as soon as they finish their college educations, um, to hurry up and get married and have babies. And I emphasize again, I'm going to get to this point a little bit later in the presentation, I emphasize that this propaganda is primarily targeting Han Chinese educated women. And, and Han, of course, are the vast majority of Chinese, but there are ethnic minorities. Um, most notably, uh, there's been a, a huge increase in um, massive repression against Uyghur, Kazakh, and other Muslims in Xinjiang and other parts of Western China. But just to start with the propaganda directed at educated Han Chinese women, you can have a look at this. This is a People's Daily article. It was a very long article that came out in December of 2015, which is exactly when the Chinese government said that it was ending the one-child policy and it was about to introduce a two-child policy. This is the headline and this is the picture that they ran. The headline is, Female University Students with Babies, Brighter Job Prospects. Subheading, Student Moms on the Rise. <laughs> this is a long story that is completely unscientific, saying that more and more women in school, in university, even in college, are deciding that it's in their best interest to, to just have a baby while they're students. And if you look at this picture, I mean, the picture itself to me is really reminiscent of Margaret Atwood's dystopian novel, A Handmaid's Tale, because the woman, you can't even see her face. She's completely silhouetted in black, and the color focus is on the baby. So uh, she's literally depicted as just a vessel for the delivery of babies. Um, one thing you can make out is that that black figure has a mortarboard on her head indicating that she has graduated from university. And that's really consistent in the propaganda. It's specifically targeting educated women. Here's some more examples of the kinds of propaganda aimed at educated women. This is another headline from a 2017 People's Daily um, article. It says, you'd better believe it, under 30 are women's best years for getting pregnant. Um, and the subheading in this particular article was female university students joyful love. Freshman year live together. Sophomore year, get pregnant. Junior year, have baby. So they're presenting the story of a college student um, and her romance trajectory as a really happy role model for other college students who are women. That go ahead, you know, shack up with somebody and hurry up and have that baby. You don't need to wait until you graduate. Um, and then they have pictures like the one uh, uh, here where you've got these new gr university graduates who are all you know, made up and traditionally very attractive and they're all cooing around a baby cradle. Um, and on the right is another university new graduate. Not only does she already have a toddler in one arm, but with her other arm, she's resting it on a very visibly pregnant belly. So she's already got her second baby on the way. Now remember, the new Chinese government policy ever since the beginning of 2016 is the two-child policy. And all across China, they're trying to get couples, um, especially in cities, but even in the countryside, to have two babies. That gets a little bit complicated because actually in the countryside people were already having two babies, sometimes more routinely. The main problem for the government as it sees it is urban couples 
not having enough children. Um, and so they're moving, the government is moving from this aggressive so-called one child policy to a very aggressive two child policy where they're exceedingly pro-natalistic. And they've just switched that propaganda practically overnight. Um, I mean, it really was overnight. At the end of 2015, they announced with great fanfare, we're ending the one child policy. Everybody's going to be allowed to have two children from now on. There were all sorts of rosy predictions about how this was going to produce a massive baby boom. And in fact, um, in uh, the first year after it was announced, there was a bit of a baby boom. But following that, in uh, 2017 and 2018, actually there was a little bit of a baby, tiny bit of a baby boom in 2017, 2018 and 2019, the birth, uh, the decrease in births has been really shocking. Now the actual official government statistics for births in 2019 have not yet been released, but there have already, there's already been a study by the intelligence, uh, Economist Intelligence Unit. From their research, they say that the total number of births is stunningly low for 2019, um, and that we haven't seen such few births since many, many decades ago, um, dating all the way back to the Great Leap Forward of the 1960s when there were about 15 to 20 million or more people who, were, who died of famine. That's very frightening for the Chinese government, which is trying to boost birth rates. So these are all things that you have to take into consideration as the backdrop. There's a demographic backdrop where the Chinese government is trying to figure out how do we get educated Han Chinese women to have more babies. Um, and this is part of its population engineering. And there's a flip side to it as well, because it has to be the right kind of women having babies, um, because there is a strong eugenics component to population engineering in China. But a little bit more about this propaganda push to, to promote traditional womanly subservient values. So on this picture here is from 2018. Um, this was one of the schools that was opened by the official state agency for women in China, the All China Women's Federation in Zhenjiang. And this school, uh, the courses were named New Era Women Courses. And New Era is a catchphrase of President Xi Jinping, um, who says that you know under Xi Jinping's leadership, China has entered a new era where it's on the ascendancy. And what are women supposed to be like in this new era? Well, they're supposed to all wear makeup properly and and be well-groomed and hold themselves in the correct posture. And here they are being trained across their legs correctly. Um, and here a quote from this text is, it's the courses are designed to quote unquote, raise the quality of young women through posture, grooming, and makeup of quote unquote, traditional culture. Now, if anybody has studied Chinese history, you'll know that traditional culture, Confucianism, uh, was largely obliterated by the Communist Party in the early years, in the 50s and the 60s, particularly during the Cultural Revolution. There was a huge attack on anything that represented traditional culture, and particularly Confucianism. But when it's convenient for the Communist Party now, they're bringing Confucianism back in a big way to push the idea that women in China have always been really subservient. And um, there, there's also a, a huge increase in gender discrimination in hiring. Um, and so there are a lot of problems that, if anybody's interested, you can ask me afterwards. But 
Uh, across the board, there's a huge resurgence of gender inequality for women today in China. Just to give you an example of the kinds of language that's being used, this is actually from 2011. Just to show you that this kind of discourse about traditional wifely virtues started to appear before Xi Jinping became president. So not all of it is entirely new. So it's been, China's been moving in this direction for a number of years, especially since 27 when I wrote about this new term called leftover women, sheng nu, which refers to single women um, in their mid-20s or older, um, and, and it insults these women and stigmatizes them. And the, the goal is to pressure them into getting married. So this was from a Xinhua News column about leftover women, and it was actually posted on the website for the All China Women's Federation. It says, pretty girls don't need a lot of education to marry into a rich and powerful family, but girls with an average or ugly appearance will find it difficult. These kinds of girls hope to further their education in order to increase their competitiveness. The tragedy is they don't realize that as women age, they are worth less and less. So by the time they get their MA or PhD, they are already old, like yellowed pearls. So um, there's a lot of propaganda columns, cartoons, uh, TV shows um, that send the message that right now at any rate, it's okay. In fact, it's encouraged so far for women to go to college. But then once they graduate from college, they're strongly discouraged from pursuing their educations, particularly at the PhD level. And as background information, women are actually uh, on parity with men at, in bachelor's degrees and even in ma master's degree programs. But then there is a really precipitous drop in the number of women who are pursuing PhDs in China or elsewhere. So getting to the other, the flip side of the pro-natalist policy that is targeting educated Han Chinese women is what you have in Xinjiang in particular is the complete opposite. And this illustrates the eugenic nature of China's population engineering. So on the one hand, the Chinese government is trying to coerce Han Chinese women into marrying early and having babies early. Um, but in Xinjiang, you actually have, I drew up this PowerPoint a, a few months ago. Um, there have already been, a, there's been a lot more news in the last few months. But basically, even in 2017, there was a, a lot of, uh, propaganda or state media warning of, quote, worryingly high birth rates and rapid population growth in Xinjiang. So clearly the Chinese government says birth rates are plummeting, then why, why are they worried that birth rates are high in Xinjiang? Shouldn't that be something that they should applaud? Well, no, because these women in Xinjiang who are Uyghur Muslim or Kazakh or Kyrgyz Muslim, those women are considered to be, so to speak, low quality. Those are undesirable according to the kind of Han supremacist Chinese government. And in 2017, um, Xinjiang officials actually ended a policy there was a long-standing policy for decades allowing ethnic minorities in China to have one child more than Han Chinese families. So uh, ethnic minorities such as Uyghur Muslims or Kazakh Muslims were routinely having three children, often even more than that. And officials, uh, until recently, would kind of turn a blind eye to that and allow it.
But in 2017, um, the Chinese authorities, particularly in Xinjiang, ended that policy and said this two-child policy applies to the entire nation. And they justified that by uh, invoking ethnic equality. But what it is is a severe new restriction on all ethnic minorities in China on their ability to have um, three children. They're no longer allowed to have three children. And uh, here's another quote, actually, this is from 2015 from a Communist Party official in Xinjiang, warning that high birth rates in Xinjiang negatively affects population quality in the region posing risks to social stability. This is a whole other area in Xinjiang where we've learned a lot about the existence of mass detention camps where there are one million or well more than a million um, Uyghurs and Kazakh and other Muslims who are incarcerated in these camps. And um, I've actually been doing a lot more research on Uyghur women recently and I've personally heard from quite a few of them that there's uh, mass sterilization of Muslim women in the region, which is incredibly disturbing. And so there is a practice of complete cultural genocide happening in Xinjiang. And that's why there are people who've said that, um, well, Maybe China, the Chinese government is going to completely lift all restrictions on having children, but I don't think that's possible given what the Chinese government is doing in Xinjiang because um, they can't justify uh, forcing women in Xinjiang to have, uh, you know, be forcibly sterilized while trying to encourage Han Chinese women in other parts of China to have more children. So um, I want to leave a lot of room for discussion. Um, getting back to this feminist movement, the feminist activists have been just incredibly inspiring and resilient. I came out with my book in uh, September of 2018, and that was, well, the Jailing of the Feminist Five happened on the eve of International Women's Day in 2015. So here we are, it's almost five years after the Feminist Five were jailed. A lot of people predicted that the feminist movement in China would just be wiped out, just as most other social movements in China are eventually wiped out, just because the forces against anybody trying to mobilize or trying to recruit supporters for a meaningful social movement are just so enormous that it, it's impossible to sustain a social movement. And yet, it's just amazing to me that these feminist activists have been able to keep their movement alive for almost five years. To me, it's really a triumph and a miracle, really. Um, so I believe that this feminist movement poses an unprecedented new form of challenge to the Chinese government. Um, why is that? There are many different reasons. One is that the activists themselves are highly organized. They're located in all sorts of different places across China, a lot of different Chinese cities. There is a large diaspora of young Chinese women who are really interested in feminism, um, and they are able to keep um, communicating with their, their peers, their friends, and family who are involved in the feminist movement inside China. So when there is a massive crackdown, when there are key feminist activists who are jailed or persecuted or otherwise unable to communicate in China, which happens all the time, then there are other activists outside China. Um, there's a new organization called the uh, Chinese Feminist Collective that was founded um, by the woman who founded Feminist Voices, which, oh, I don't have it up here, but Feminist Voices, Niu Qian Zhisheng, was the most influential um, social media platform for feminist essays and ideas 
um, and it was on Weibo and WeChat, and that was banned in 2018, again, on International Women's Day. Um, but in spite of the banning of feminist voices, there has still been an enormous amount of activity, particularly related to Me Too and sexual violence. And there are all these hashtags, uh, various kinds of hashtags that go viral every now and then, um, and they continue to do so. And so this is proving, the feminist resistance is proving to be a unique new form of resistance that the Chinese government really hasn't figured out how to cope with yet. And to me, that gives me a lot of hope for the future. So uh, Me Too was actually one of the top, set, top 10 censored topics on WeChat in 2018, according to a very large scale survey by Hong Kong University, which is really stunning given the number of very politically sensitive topics in China, like you know, the Tiananmen Massacre or independence for Hong Kong or independence for Taiwan. There are so many off limits political topics and yet Me Too made it into the top 10 most censored items. So another reason why I believe this feminist movement in China is proven to be so resilient is that it resonates with literally hundreds of millions of women in China. And it's not just women either. It's um, you know all members of the LGBTQ rights movement or community, non-binary people, um, male allies. Because the movement is so dynamic, um, it really appeals to a lot of young people. And so, I think it's the most transformative social movement that I have seen in China since 1989. Um, and that picture up there kind of encapsulates the spirit of the movement. Those women are so colorfully dressed, they're kind of like um, borrowing from Pussy Riot in Russia. Um, and you would think they're celebrating, they're doing this dance, but in fact, if you look at the banner here, it says feminism will never die. They were, this was part of a mock burial for feminist voices, which was um, that social media platform that was banned in 2018. These feminist activists in Southern China went out, did a mock burial, um, protesting the fact that feminist voices was banned, but at the same time they were celebrating because feminism will never die. And I think that's a really good image to end on. Thank you very much.